Well, you can't say that Atari was known for giving up. Hello and welcome to Video Game Retrospective. Today, we look at one of Atari's classic systems that, well, didn't quite become the massive success that Atari hoped it would be. So the Atari 5200 is likely the console we have talked about the most on this channel. If you haven't seen our two-part series going over why the system failed, you really should, since it's vital to the story of the 5200 sequel, the 7800. But in short, the 5200 was released in 1982 as a response to the new generation of more powerful systems like the Intellivision and the ColecoVision, due to many issues like the terrible controller, and a less than compelling software library, the system sold quite poorly. This new system, whose name was chosen as it was the addition of 5200 and 2600, was designed by General Computer Corporation, who have one of the most fascinating product lists of any tech company. They began by making unauthorized modification boards for popular arcade games. Some of their early arcade mods include Super Missile Attack for Atari's Missile Command, and Crazy Auto, a mod for Pac-Man. Now, Crazy Auto might not sound familiar, but once they licensed their mod to Midway, the title was renamed to something a lot more recognizable, Ms. Pac-Man. From there, they would work on many projects for Atari, like the arcade title Food Fight. They would release a few titles for the Atari 2600, but hit their real stride with the 5200. They would develop the vast majority of Atari's own published games on the system. They would design the 7800 with two primary goals, be more powerful than the 5200, and be cheaper to produce. And they achieved that, sort of. The CPU would be a custom variant of the MOS 6502, the same CPU used in the 5200, but now named the Sally. Both systems' CPUs run at 1.79 MHz. Honestly, the CPU isn't much of an upgrade in actual performance, but it is a big step up in flexibility, allowing the system to push more of the work from the CPU to other components. Probably the most important component is the graphics chip, the Maria. The Maria chip is heavily based on the advanced graphics chips Atari was using in arcade systems at the time. Running at 7.15 MHz, it represented a massive increase in graphics power over the 5200 and offered quite a few different scanline modes with extreme flexibility in the handling of sprites. Many 7800 games didn't really show off the 7800's power, unfortunately, since they were based on the simple arcade games of the past five years. But games like Ninja Golf or Xevious show off just how ahead the 7800 was compared to any other consoles available in 1984. The biggest downside to the 7800's hardware by far was the sound. In order to keep the system's price down, Atari would use the TIA chip for sound. This chip was already needed in the system for backwards compatibility with the 2600, but using it as the sound chip for new 7800 games as well would save a good amount of money. This means that 7800 games sound exactly like the rudimentary blips and white noise the 2600 had been offering since 1977. Developers were not thrilled with this, so as a consolation, Atari designed the system so game cartridges could include their own sound chips for better sound. But since that would drastically raise the price of games, only two were ever released, Ballblazer and Commando. Each of these used the same pokey chip that had been built into the 5200. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, this was a terrible idea. By the time consumers were able to see the new system in action, its lame sound capabilities reinforced the idea that this new system was just more of the exact same thing Atari had been peddling since the beginning of the Carter administration. From day one of the 7800's announcement, many journalists questioned Atari's timing. Many consumers were turned off from the brand thanks to the 5200, 
and at best the video game market was on a downturn, and at worst, it had crashed. Still, Atari was assured that they were being very careful not to remake the mistakes of the 5200. After all, this new system would be cheaper with a $140 launch price, it would play Atari 2600 games natively, and it would ship with a less complicated controller. As a test, Atari released the 7800 in extremely limited numbers in the test market of Southern California. The response was somewhat mixed, too positive. Testers liked the impressive graphics and the speed of games, but were not thrilled with the sound and found that the games that were available were really high quality, but not all that exciting since they were largely games they could have already played in the arcade. Still, there was a decent amount of buzz for this new system with true arcade quality graphics. Surely the 7800 would be the hottest tech item for the Christmas of 1984, at least for those not putting a Commodore 64 at the top of their list. Except, it wouldn't be Atari without some drama. You see, overall Atari was not doing well financially. Sales of the 2600 had slowed down quite drastically, the 5200 had been a complete money pit, and the home computer price war between Atari, Commodore, and Texas Instruments had left Atari in a quaint second place while losing money on most systems sold. In 1983, Atari had lost a massive $500 million. Atari's parent company, Warner Communications, wanted out. But who would take a tainted company that was bleeding money off their hands? Enter Jack Trammell. Jack was the recently ousted founder of Commodore Computers. Under Jack's leadership, Commodore had rose from a small typewriter company to dominating the early electronic calculator market, then had back-to-back-to-back -back success with the Commodore PET, Commodore VIC-20, and the Commodore 64. However, Jack was a controversial leader. He was well known for micromanaging and being very headstrong. If Jack wanted something done a specific way, it was no matter what. While this style was arguably what led to Commodore's success, it also didn't make Jack any friends on Commodore's board of directors. There's a lot of he said, she said going on, but what's certain is that by January of 1984, Jack was done with Commodore, and the rest of the board was done with him. Jack was a rich man with a very large golden parachute, now free to explore other ventures. He also likely held a grudge against his former allies. What better way to get back at them than by making their primary competition a serious threat? Jack's acquisition of Atari would have a lot of consequences. His primary goals in the short term were reducing costs to get the company back in the green. This involved canceling many of Atari's in-development projects, as well as laying off a majority of Atari's workers and shutting down dozens of offices. Coming from Commodore, Jack was a computer man first. He saw the value in the Atari 2600 as a consistent revenue stream, but wasn't interested in releasing a new console. Instead, he wanted to focus on the computer market. And with the chaos of reorganizing combined with the shrinking of the console market, the 7800 launch was canceled with little debate. There was also the issue of paying General Computer for their work designing the system and its launch titles. Jack and Warner Communications both insisted that the other was on the hook for paying off GCC. The legal battle lasted into 1985, in which time it would have been impossible to launch the system. Eventually, Jack acquiesced and paid GCC. And that's where things would have stayed, with the 7800 destined to be part of the long, long list of cancelled prototypes Atari made over the years. Except, a massive rejuvenation to the US video game market was just around the corner thanks to a rather unheard of company called Nintendo. Nintendo would revive the US console market with the release of the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985. The Japanese version of the NES, the Famicom, had been out for two years by that point and was dominating the Japanese console market. In order to sell the system in the US, which was still rather jaded towards consoles by the events of the previous five years, Nintendo had to reinvent the system from top to bottom. First was the new design, making the system look more like a utility device, like those cool new front-loading videotape systems that were all the rage. And creating a Trojan horse of marketing, 
by selling the system primarily as a toy rather than an electronic device. While the first few months of sales were rather sluggish, Nintendo's marketing and word of mouth made the system a massive success, particularly with a new, younger market. By 1986, Nintendo was nothing short of a craze, thanks to the likes of classic games like Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda, launching the company into even more profitable enterprises like toy and merchandise sales. Atari saw this success and decided they wanted a piece of that pie. They dusted off the thousands of 7,800 units that had been sitting in a warehouse collecting dust and the stock of launch titles and prepared to take on Nintendo. But Nintendo was doing extremely well with a software lineup already exceeding 30 titles with more games releasing on a monthly basis and had an annual marketing budget of $16 million, a figure five to six times what Atari would be able to put up for the 7800. They were in for one hell of an upwards fight. Somehow, the company that had established the home console market and fended off underdog challenges from Mattel and Coleco was now themselves the underdog fighter. This would prove interesting. Oh, also, uh, Sega was there too. I, uh, kind of didn't really find a good place to mention them, but they were also establishing themselves with the, the Master System, so yeah, even more competition. And that's where we're going to leave the story for today. Next time, we are going to see how the fight between the NES and the 7800 would turn out, and talk about whether or not I think the 7800 is a worthwhile system to add to your collection. So if you don't want to miss that video, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Of course, let me know in the comments down below what you think of the 7800. I love reading the comments under the first part of a series as I make tweaks to the second part. Sometimes your comments are invaluable to covering things that I otherwise would not have thought of, so definitely let me know down in the comments below what you think. Of course, if you'd like to help support this show financially so we can keep the lights on, you can do so by checking out our Patreon, and if you'd like to talk about any number of retro video game consoles or retro computers, you can join our Discord server. And I'll see you guys next time.